The Manchester Man by Mrs. George Linnaeus Banks Chapter 24 Madame Broadbent's Fan They had made their exit from the Fountain Street end of the box lobby to avoid the rush from the gallery door in Back Mosley Street, which somewhat lengthened the short distance Jabus had to convey his precious charge, who appeared more apprehensive of offending Madame Broadbent by scant and unceremonious leave-taking, than troubled by the impertinence of the young officers. Truth to tell, the whole adventure had a savour of Miss Bohanna's circulating library about it, and she felt herself elevated into a heroine by the occurrence. But her appearance before Madame Broadbent in the morning would be very real and unromantic that lady resenting nothing so much as disrespect. You see, Jabus, I did not even make a curtsy to her as we came away. I am afraid she will be displeased. If you think so, Miss Ashton, he replied respectfully, I will hasten back as soon as I have seen you safely home and bear your apologies to Madame Broadbent. She may not have left the theatre. Besides, I feel that I also owe an apology for leaving a lady of her age unprotected in the midst of such a scene. It was very remiss on my part, he added, but indeed at the time I thought only of placing you beyond reach of further insult, and Augusta could hear him mutter between his teeth, the impertinent puppy. The distance even from Fountain Street was very inconsiderable, and they had reached the broad steps of the door in Mosley Street, and his hand was on the lion-headed knocker when this ejaculation escaped him. Service from Jabus was so much a matter of course that Augusta regarded his care for herself and his offer to run back at her bidding only in the light of apprentice duty. But that muttered exclamation spoke of smothered passion, and before James was roused from his doze in front of the faraway kitchen fire by that peal on the knocker and sleepily opened the door, she had added a caution as an addendum to her message to Madame Broadbent. I hope, Jabus, you are not going back to interfere or quarrel with Mr. Walmsley and the other officer. If they are not quite sober, you must remember they are gentlemen. I will forget nothing I should remember, Miss Ashton, said he, as James unclosed the door for her entrance. And he darted off, the emphasis she had laid on her closing words having stung him keenly with a sense of his social inferiority in her sight. She evidently thinks the apprentice college boy has no right to raise his hand against gentility in uniform, however drunk or disorderly it may be, he thought, as he ran along spurred by a manly desire to show that it was not cowardice which had caused him to leave his prostrate enemy in the hands of a deputy. He was not three minutes in reaching the box entrance in Back Mosley Street, but for all that the short walk home and the brief delay caused by sleepy-headed James had given ample time to empty and close the theatre, from which more than half the audience had dispersed before they left. Even the oil lamps over the doors were extinguished, and though a few stragglers loitered about, the natural angers on to histrionic skirts, and there were brawlers in the neighbourhood, he saw none of those he went to seek. The fact was, Captain Travis had all Lieutenant Aspinall from the ground with little ceremony, and, with a sharp reproof for the disgrace he was bringing on their corps by insulting a young lady in a public place, as if sufficient odium did not attach to the yeomanry already, forced him into a waiting hackney carriage, giving the driver orders to bear him home to his father's house on Ardwick Green. Heedless of the young officers, remonstrance to the contrary, but Jehu, who knew his fare, drove him instead to the Georgian Dragon, on the opposite side of the green, and Mr. Aspinall saw nothing of his hopeful son that night, nor would Charlotte Walmsley have seen much more of her husband, had not kind-hearted Ben gone far out of his own way to land John safely at home. Perhaps it would be hardly fair to calculate too nicely how far he was influenced to that, by the relation of the Walmsleys to Ellen Chadwick, since the secret springs of action often lie too far down, even for self-knowledge. As for Madame Broadbent, no sooner had Miss Nuttall disposed 
of the last of the budding misses than she hid her indignation in the deep shadow of her large calash, and with an excess of importance left the theatre, slightly in advance of her humble dependence, and made her fearless way through Fountain Street and High Street, with a step which augured unpleasantness for all beneath her roof, if her supper were not done to a turn and served to a nicety. Augusta was somewhat loath to leave her pillow in the morning, after the night's unusual dissipation, and was still more reluctant to encounter her lessons and Mrs. Broadbent, and she for the first time remarked to Cicely that she thought she was quite too old to go to school, as if the world was not one new school wherein the dunces get punished most severely, and even the best and brightest do not escape the rod. But Augusta Ashton, buoyant, blooming, cherished, admired, adored, could not see that her real schooling would begin when Madame Broadbent's reign ceased. No doubt Mr. Ashton would have been coaxed into granting an extension of his darling daughter's Easter holiday, and suffered her to remain at home that Thursday morning, but he was at Whaley Bridge, and Mamma met her request with, No, my dear, you have had quite holiday enough. It will be setting a bad example to infringe Madame Broadbent's rules. Go, my dear, and go cheerfully. I will send Cicely for you at noon. The streets will be rather rough this week. She went, though not cheerfully, and Cicely was duly dispatched to bring her home, but neither Cicely nor Miss Ashton had returned when dinner was put upon the table at half past twelve o'clock. Then Mrs. Ashton recalled her own words respecting the rough streets, and the insult offered as unwelcome tribute to Augusta's beauty overnight, and though by no means a nervous woman, the mother grew restless and apprehensive. A lovely daughter, who is an only child, is so very anxious a charge. As she sat down to her solitary meal, Another thought crossed her mind. James, ask Mr. Clegg to oblige me by stepping this way. Mr. Clegg was with her in an instant. The summons was unusual. Jabez, I'll thank you to ascertain why Miss Ashton has not returned from school at the usual time. Cicely has been gone almost an hour. Should Madame be keeping her in for any breach of etiquette last night? Pray offer an apology for me and my daughter also, but at the same time politely insist on Miss Ashton's immediate return to dinner. I believe I owe Madame Broadbent an apology myself, answered Jabez, smiling. I shall be glad of an opportunity to discharge the debt. The schoolroom door was midway down the dark, narrow, arched entry. Groups of girls with slates and bags in their hands loitering on the pathway at the entrance and in the passage, made way for him, with curious loops and whispers amongst themselves. Jabez was not unknown to some of the senior pupils. The schoolroom door stood ajar. The old place was in a commotion, unprecedented in that precise establishment. Madame Broadbent, holding by the copy-slip axiom, familiarity breeds contempt, preserved her dignity and that of her high office by avoiding personal contact with her pupils, save at stated hours. Her assistant governesses were at their post from nine until twelve, from two until four, but Madame herself only sailed into the long room from the house door across the entry at eleven o'clock to receive reports, inspect work, dispense rewards, or administer reproof and chastisement. Spare the rod and spoil the child had not been abolished from the educational code fifty-five years back. The double shock her importance had received at the theatre sent her home to quarrel with her supper, and, as a meal dispatched in an ill humour does not easily digest, Othello and the castle spectre haunted her pillow and broke her rest with nightmares. She rose late and stepped into her schoolroom later than usual to visit her accumulation of disagreeables on minor delinquents, as well as on the primary offenders. Let us be just. Madame Broadbent had gracious smiles and approving words to dispense to the ultra-good, and their very rarity made them valuable. But if she rewarded any that day, 
It was only that severity might stand out in contrast. Little hearts beat, little fingers plied industrious needles, little eyes bent over work, when Madame's step was heard in the entry. But when her august presence fairly filled the room, every little damsel rose simultaneously and saluted her entrance with a low, formal, deferential curtsy. Two rooms had evidently been thrown into one, to give required space, the back portion being curiously lit by a narrow, small-paned window, extending along the side, high above the rows of racks and pegs. It was the writing end of the room. Madame Broadbent occupied a seat in the front portion, almost opposite to the door, and as she marched towards it with more than ordinary loftiness, and beat her fan on her table with one peremptory tap, instead of a short, rapid quiver, to enforce her command. Attention, ladies! The very youngest of those ladies could interpret the signs portentously. Lucky was the young lady who had worked past muster that morning. So many were condemned to stocks, backboard, columns of spelling, recitations from the speaker and Thompson's seasons, lengths of hope and hem, backstitching or seeming. At length, Madame Broadbent, Having dismissed ordinary business, wrapped her fan upon the table, and in a sharp, peremptory tone called, Miss Ashton, and Miss Ashton, who had been expecting the summons all the morning, came forward at her bidding, but not with the normal alacrity of pupilage. She had left her childhood, I had almost said her girlhood, behind her in the box lobby of the Theatre Royal. Miss Brooks, cried the same sharp voice, and with a painful start the little girl, who had committed such a terrible breach of decorum before a whole theatre as to utter her impromptu commentary on the tragedian's art, rose, trembled, burst into tears, but was too agitated to obey with sufficient promptitude. Her seat was on a low front form. Madame took a step forward, stretched out her arm, and dragged the child by the ear, to the side of Augusta, then gave her a smart cuff as an admonition to more prompt obedience another time, then with another rap of her fan on the table which set all arts palpitating, she began an inflated harangue to the might of a child and the budding woman, in which she reproached them both with bringing disgrace on the academy, hitherto so irreproachable. The one had drawn the attention of her whole theatre to her ill-breeding and want of proper training. The other, by boldness of look and manner, had licensed the free speech of loose men, and as if that were not enough, had been the cause of an unpardonable insult to herself. She, Madame Broadbent, so highly honoured and respected by the chief people in the town, to be called Mother Broadbent, it was an outrage not to be endured. A temper interrupted her oration. She shook Augusta violently and condemned her to remain in school until she had learned one of Mrs. Chapone's letters by heart. Then she darted on the smaller miss as the primary cause of all, shook her till the little teeth chattered and dragged her by the lobe of the ear towards a dark closet set apart for heinous offenders. Something akin to rebellion had been growing in Augusta's breast all the morning. She was a girl of quick impulses and sympathies, and was not only struck by the disproportion of punishment meted out, but by the terror on the little one's face. She threw herself in their path, and to the utter astonishment alike of pupils and teachers, laid hold of the child to release her, exclaiming as she did so, you shall not lock her in the dark. You will kill her with fright, you cruel Madame Broadbent. If Madame Broadbent had been wrathful before, she was furious now. Never in her long experience had she been so braved. Without thought, without premeditation, she raised her heavy fan and struck sharply at Augusta. The blow fell on her beautiful bare neck. The collarbone snapped, as it will do with a very slight matter, and Augusta dropped. Cicely, waiting outside at the time, 
heard Madame's raised voice and Augusta's impetuous remonstrance, then a thud, a fall, and a suppressed scream from the girls, and without pausing to knock she pushed open the door. Cicely had been too long the recipient of Augusta's schoolgirl confidence to stand in much awe of Mrs. Broadbent at best of times. Now she darted forward to raise her young mistress, whom she almost worshipped, and certainly did not consult either Madame's feelings or dignity in the epithets she launched at her. No one had been more electrified at the effect of that stroke with the fan than Mrs. Broadbent's self. She seemed petrified, and Cicely's indignant outburst fell on deaf ears. But, as Miss Nuttall ran for water, and Cicely cried out for a doctor, she roused to self-consciousness, and closed the schoolroom door as if to keep the outer world in ignorance of what was going on inside. A wide latitude was then allowed for school discipline, but even Madame Broadbent was sensible that the blow which had felled Mr. Ashton's only daughter was a blow to imperil her seminary. Augusta did not revive. Miss Nuttall suggested that the school should be dismissed and a doctor fetched, and before either could be effected, Jabus was on the spot. He took in the scene at a glance. Augusta, white as her frock, her hair all in disorder, lay extended on a form, her head supported by the kneeling Cicely, whilst excited girls and teachers flocked helplessly around. Good heavens, what is the matter? What has happened to Miss Ashton? was his hurried and agitated inquiry. One said one thing, one another. Wrathful Cicely came nearest to the mark. That old wretch has struck our darling with a great fan. I'm afeard her neck bones broken. Impossible! She could not be so heartless, he cried as the group made way for him to pass, and he knelt down opposite to the sobbing Cicely on the other side of the form and sprinkled the pallid face so dear to him with water someone had brought in. There was no sign of revival. My God, this is terrible. Oh, madam, how could you do it? Mrs. Ashton will be distracted, and he started to his feet, inexpressible anguish in every feature. But this is no time for revilings. Where is the nearest doctor? There is Mr. Campbell in Hanover Street, and brushing unceremoniously past his informant, he was with the Scotch surgeon before Miss Nuttall had recovered from her surprise, or Madame from her stupor. Mr. Campbell was quickly on his way to attend this new patient, and Jabez speeding towards the top of Market Street. There, he hired a hackney coach from the stand, close as he was to home, and drove straight to Dr. Hull's. He bore the doctor from his unfinished dinner, with impetuosity, brooking no delay. They found Augusta Ashton, faint, pale, but restored to consciousness in Madame's own dingy parlour where the author of the mischief was doing her best to put a favourable colour on the disaster. Chapter 25 Retrospective The collarbone was broken, there was no mistake about that, but Jabus, mindful of Mrs. Ashton's protracted anxiety, lingered no longer, where he would fain have remained, to see the surgeon prepare under Dr. Hull's supervision to reduce the fracture, a delicate process, since to the collarbone no splints can be applied. Augusta's affection for her mother overcame her pain. You will be careful how you tell Mamma, Jabez, I know. Do not frighten her more than you can help. She will be so terribly distressed faintly murmured she, as he again departed. With all his haste and care, so much time had been spent, Mrs. Ashton's fears had already conjured up all manners of evils, all of course wide of the mark. That something was wrong she felt assured, and he found a dressing to follow her dilatory messengers. The stoppage of the coach and his evident agitation were confirmatory, but the absolute facts roused as much indignation as grief. Yet Mrs. Ashton never forgot herself, and though the waiting coach bore her to Bradshaw Street, to add her maternal reproaches to the wrathful utterances of Cicely, the rough rebukes of Dr. Hull, and the prickings of Madame Broadbent's own conscience, 
the natural dignity of her manner more overawed and impressed the resentful schoolmistress than all which had gone before. She was as profuse in apologies as in extenuating pleas, but she was not prepared to combat Mrs. Ashton's proverbial argumentation. Facts are stubborn things, madame, and she who cannot govern herself is not fit to govern others. Neither coach-making nor road-making had reached the acme of perfection, and Augusta's removal home without the displacement of the bone had to be considered. A sedan-chair, one of the last in the town, was still kept for invalid use behind the infirmary. Jabus was aware of this, and before Dr. Hull could make the suggestion, he had proposed to go for it, and was back with the black brass nail sedan long before the doctors thought their patient fit to be removed. As the unfamiliar vehicle waited at the academy door, it attracted the notice not only of neighbours and returning schoolgirls, but of passers-by, until Madame Broadbent was in a fever. The reputation of her school was at stake, and she felt that every extra moment that hand carriage and wheel carriage remained standing there, the brute of the lamentable occurrence was spreading farther afield. There had been no cessation of afternoon school duties, albeit the teachers alone presided and discipline was somewhat relaxed. But when patient, doctors, friends and vehicles had gone their way, and the school was soon after dismissed, the harassed, agitated and prescient disciplinarian surrendered herself to alternate fits of hysteria, passion, lamentation and overweening assumption. That first outburst over, the self-important dame stood on her right to maintain discipline, even when confronted by Mr. Ashton, no longer the easy-going pleasant parent of a paying pupil, but the angry father of an injured only child, who had posted from Whaley Bridge on the first intelligence of the mischance, leaving his business incomplete. Not alone to the inmates of the house in Mosley Street was Augusta Ashton precious, Notwithstanding her sometime waywardness, the result of her father's overindulgence, she had endeared herself by her affectionate heart and winsome ways to a wide circle of friends. Even Joshua Brutes was less grim with Augusta, so no wonder Jabez was secretly devoted to her heart and soul. Great and general was the sympathy expressed on the occasion. Mrs. Chadwick and Ellen, were with Mrs. Ashton before the afternoon was out, and, at Augusta's eager desire, her cousin remained behind, not only for companionship but as chief nurse, an office for which Ellen had that peculiar fitness observable in some women, coupled with the deafness and experience gained in long attendance on her father. And now, leaving Augusta in the hands of love and skill, with all that affection and wealth can lavish upon her, in furtherance of recovery, let us step backwards to the previous September, when Peterloo was fresh, and Jabus yet wore his left arm in a sling. Whaley Bridge has been mentioned more than once, for in that village, near the high road from Manchester to Buxton, Mr. Ashton possessed a watermill on the picturesque banks of the River Goyt, which there divided the counties of Cheshire and Derbyshire. It had been established in the previous century, together with another in the contiguous vale of Taxel, by a speculative ancestor of Mrs. Ashton, whose old hall was in the locality. The two places had been chiefly colonised by his workpeople, many of whom had been pauper apprentices from Manchester and Warrington. Besides the mill, Mr. Ashton owned the White Hart Inn, close to the bridge where the Buxton coaches stopped, and Carr Cottage, a long, low, rough-cast building, nestling under the shadow of a fine old farmhouse, which crowned the elevated ridge of Yearsley cum Whaley, Langsyne, the Gothic stone hall of the warlike Yearsleys. From this farmhouse, Carr Cottage was separated by a retired walk at the back, which itself, a wilderness of nettles, gave access to the cellarage, and a clear well led the adventurer away up the hill between the cottage grounds and the farmer's tall, high-banked edges. 
which almost overtopped the cottage roof, and on the left of the cottage, as viewed from the high road, spread the granary, stabling and farmyard, enclosed by remains of the ancient wall, and entered by a step or two through an ancient Gothic doorway, over which ivy and honeysuckle clambered in luxurious rivalry. The cottage, which on each floor contained four capacious rooms in its length, was on the ground divided in the middle by a respectable lobby, the house-place and kitchen lying on the left, the parlours to the right as you entered. There were two staircases, one at each end of the building, the one running upwards in the kitchen itself, the other from a small enclosed space at the back of a parlour, containing also a china closet door, and lit by a low window close to the foot of the staircase, whence it was possible to step out into the garden, unseen by anyone in the house. Otherwise, both chambers and parlours had doors of communication from end to end of the building, the two middle chambers being only accessible through the others. The lower windows in the front, at least those of the large parlours, were brought close to the ground, and overlooked a charming landscape, descending at first suddenly from the widespread flower garden, with its one great sycamore to the right of the cottage for shade, then with a gradual slope to a bean field below, to a meadow crossed by a narrow rill, then, after a wider stretch of grass, the alder and hazel fringe of a trout stream skirting the high road, on the far side of which tall poplars waved, and in autumn shed their leaves in the wider waters of the Goit, fresh from the bridge, where the road bends. Rivulets, road and river, ran parallel, and from the road a broad wooden gate gave access over a bridge across the trout stream to a wide, steep avenue between trim hedges, rising to the level of the cottage, in itself as delightful a retreat as any weary denizen of town could desire. To Mr. Ashton it was necessary, as an adjunct to his factory, an occasional home for his family in the summer, a lodge for himself when a visit of inspection was desirable. Hearing that the general discontent was spreading amongst his own workpeople at Whaley Bridge, Mr. Ashton, without waiting for the stagecoach, put himself into a long-skirted drab overcoat with eye collar and small double cape and ordered reluctant James to find another for Clegg, and, having stowed away a carpet-bag and a case of pistols, lest they should be molested on the road, he mounted his high gig with Jabez by his side, and set off to take the bull by the horns, as Mrs. Ashton had advised. Away they drove through the mild September air, up London Road, where houses had been growing in the years since we scanned it last, and passed out of it green pond, where a dashing young buck booted and spurred, lounged at the door of the quaint George and Dragon, and followed them curiously with his eyes, yet not so swiftly, but Jabez had time to recognise with accelerated pulse his former assailant, Lawrence. Longsight, Burnage, Fallowfield left behind, Stockport Bridge gained. They went walking by their horse's head up the steep hill, between frowning houses, to the pack-horse in the market-place, where the beast was baited, and the travellers dined at the same table, Jabus not for one moment forgetting the social distance between his master and himself. Again seated in the gig, they quickly left the smoke-begrimed higgledy-piggledy mass of brick and mortar, called Stockport, behind, and were away on country roads where yellow leaves were blown into their faces, where brown-faced, white-headed cottage children were stripping blackberries from the wayside brambles, or ripe nuts from the luxuriant hazels, which have since changed the very name of the bullock smithy through which they drove at a gallop to Hazel Grove. It was a glorious treat for Jabus was that drive, and Mr. Ashton, conversing with him as they went, was surprised to discover his love of nature and his knowledge of her secrets, this induced reminiscences of the early years of Jabus, when Simon took him pickerback into the fields on Sundays, and Mr. Ashton led him on to dilate on his childhood among his first friends, until he had a closer insight into the younger man's heart 
in all the years he had served them, but the object of their journey had not been forgotten, and at Disley, hearing Mr. Ashton remark that they were but three miles from Whaley Bridge, Jabez ventured to suggest, Do you think, sir, as I am unknown in Whaley Bridge, I might make enquiries and ascertain the feeling of the people better if I went on foot, having no apparent connection with you? That is a wise thought of yours, young man. Just so, I will put you down at the next milestone. Here's a guinea for your expenses at the White Hart, but country people are inquisitive. What do you propose to be? Well, sir, I took the liberty to bring a sketchbook with me. I don't get many such opportunities. I could represent myself as an artist, or I could cram my pockets with plants and roots as I went along and say I was a botanist in search of specimens. Stick to the artist, Jabus. Our country botanists would soon floor you on their own ground. They know more of plants than pencils, I'll warrant. And Mr. Ashton, handing the reins to Jabus, took a pinch of snuff on the strength of it. Mr. Ashton, putting up the collar of his topcoat, drove direct to car, much to the surprise of his unprepared overlooker and wife, who had charge of the cottage. He said nothing of any companion, and Jabez some twenty minutes later walked into the bar of the White Hart, dusty and weary, as if with long walking, called for bread and cheese and ale, intimated his intention to remain the night, if he could have a bed, talked of the scenery and led the host to tell of the best points for sketching. Professing fatigue, he kept his seat in the bar parlour the remainder of the day. The sling, not yet wholly discarded, drew attention as he expected it would. The incomers, eyeing him askance, talked politics before him, and finding him less glib than themselves, whispered that he was a refugee from Peterloo and to show their sympathy with the party to which he was supposed to belong, freely discussed the political aspect of the district before him. He was young, free with his money, and they were not reticent. He found that the overlooker had made himself and his master through himself obnoxious to his weavers, and that only prompt measures would prevent an outbreak. The next morning Mr. Ashton put his head into the inn, greeted Mr. Clegg, as someone he was surprised to meet in so remote a spot, and invited him to Carr Cottage. Jabus accepted the invitation for the afternoon, saying he could not spare the morning. Under pretense of sketching, he took his way by the goit to the neighbourhood of the mill, with pencils and sketchbook. Women and children flocked inquisitively around him in their dinner hour and talked to him. Then he rested in a weaver's cot, and when he found his way to Carr, in the afternoon, and sat with Mr. Ashton for privacy under the dropping keys of the sycamore, he had brought with him the key to the prevailing discontent. Mr. Ashton listened, took an enormous quantity of snuff, dropped an occasional just so, and knowing the sore, set about healing it. He drove back to Manchester, leaving Jabus as his temporary deputy. High honour for so young a man, and the overlooker was required to render up his accounts. A fortnight later, as Jabus was midway up the avenue to Carr in the afternoon, he turned, hearing the blithe bugle of the coming Buxton coach, and watched its dashing progress along the road. To his astonishment it stopped at the gate. He himself reached the spot at a run. His eyes had not played him false. Simon Clegg in his best clothes was there on the box seat, Tom Newman, Bess, and Little Syme sat close behind him. Mr. Ashton was himself an inside passenger. In the bustle and confusion of alighting and dragging boxes from the boot and from the top, curiosity was kept on the stretch. It was not until the entire party were under the roof of the cottage that Jabus was enlightened. Tom Newman was the new overlooker. Bess the new caretaker of Carr Cottage, which was henceforth their rural rent-free home, and to Simon, long disqualified by rheumatism from the wet and slush of the tannery, was given the charge of the garden, with a boy under him, 
and of all the group old Simon and little Syme were most delighted. Some eight months before, Syme, then about two years old, had slipped on the frosty stones in the old Long Millgate yard, and, rolling down its rugged declavity, was supposed to have injured his spine, and he had been too delicate ever since to run about freely. To the child, therefore, whose shoulders seemed unnaturally high, the change from the stifling court was something too exuberant for expression. To Simon Clegg, who in losing his crony Matt, had felt the old haunts oppressive, the bountiful expanse of nature before him, and the comfortable fragrant home, were matters for deep thankfulness. My lad, said he to Jabus, when the latter was about to depart with Mr. Ashton, after they were fairly inducted, our best said there would be a godsend to us, and there has been, this paradise of posies, has all grown out of thy cradle, God bless thee. I think, my dear, the experiment will succeed. There is a matronly air of respectability about Mrs. Hume that will help to uphold her husband's position amongst the work people, and I can trust his soldierly discipline for keeping the rebellious in order. Thus said Mr. Ashton to his good lady, sitting by the fireside after supper, the night of his return home. Then, after a little pondering and trifling with his snuff-box, he added, as if reflectively, It is all very well, my dear, to serve the young man's friends and ourselves at the same time, but I should like to do something for Jabez himself. It is entirely to his clear head and his tact that we owe the preservation of peace at Whaley Bridge. I should like to give him a rise. My dear William, make no more haste than good speed, and never do things in a hurry, replied his calm proverbial philosopher. We must not excite the envy of his fellow clerks, or we shall surround him with enemies from the first. In removing his humble friends, you have cleared one barrier to his advancement. Mr. Ashton did not say just so, for a wonder. He turned his gold box round and round in his fingers, and at length gave utterance to a thought which took Mrs. Ashton by surprise. If we remove all the young man's old associations, don't you think we ought to provide him with new ones? I think, William, we ought to leave well alone. Smooth paths are slippery paths. The young man will be out of his time in six months. You can then advance him if you think proper in the warehouse, but I do not feel disposed to open our drawing room to him, if that is what you are driving at. And she drew herself up as if her dignity had received a blow. Well, no, not exactly. And Mr. Ashton, unable to express what he did mean exactly, shuffled and fidgeted till he upset his snuff on the Brussels carpet. Chapter 26 On the Portico Steps Between that expedition to Whaley Bridge, with its terminal, connubial conversation, and the breakage of Augusta Ashton's collarbone, rather more than six months intervened. Six months during which Mr. Clegg, as his good master had anticipated, felt the solitary state of his trim sitting-room somewhat oppressive, the permission to receive his old friends becoming a nullity on their removal. He occupied a position midway between parlour and kitchen, above his old associates of the porringers, the fireside settle and the sanded stone floor, and beneath the family, seated round the tea-urn, on cushioned chairs and Brussels carpet. Towards the former he cast few backward looks of regret. He had put his past behind him, but oh, who shall tell his unuttered longings for the open sesame to that paradise of which he had one rapturous glimpse, and one only, that paradise where his master's daughter, so high above him, moved like a seraph and filled the air with harmony. I am afraid that at this time he brooded over his orphanhood 
and that unknown father who had disappeared so mysteriously and strained his soaring thoughts in their flight towards possibilities more than was good for him. He was too much alone for one of his years, and there were times in those long candlelit winter evenings when books and pencils dropped from his wearied hands, and for lack of a companion he held dreamy converse with the fire. Of course his library was restricted, and there were no institutions in Manchester at that time where young men of his class could meet for mutual improvement, or that mental polish caused by the attrition of mind upon mind. Occasionally, at long intervals, and at first to the utter confusion of James, Captain Travis had inquired for Mr. Clegg, and been shown into the little sitting-room with a disregard to caste very creditable to both of them, and now and then Mr. Chadwick and Mr. Ashton would drop in together for half an hour's chat, the gratitude of the former being deeper than the surface, but rarely did a feminine face save Sicily's brighten up his solitude, and she, devoted to her young mistress, had always something to say about Augusta, if only what she wore or how she looked, which sent him off into dreamland immediately. Sunday was a very chequered day, when he missed his old friends most. True, he followed the family to church, perhaps carried Augusta's prayer boot, exchanged a word of kindly greeting with old Mrs. Clues and Parson Brooks, who was not as hale as he had been. But there was no old Simon to grip his hand, no best to give him a motherly smile, and, unless the weather was fine enough for a ramble in the fields with Nelson for companion, the rest of the day was very dull indeed. The farm which broke Augusta's collarbone broke down a barrier for Jabus. No personal sacrifice attended the service he rendered. He but went and came as an active messenger, but he went and came with intelligence and promptitude, and exercised for mother and daughter both the care and forethought of a much older man. In the father's absence, the father was not missed. What came under Mrs. Ashton's own eye, Mrs. Ashton could appreciate, and the commendation of Dr. Hull was not without its weight. He had said, Capital fellow to send for a doctor, that messenger of yours, Mrs. Ashton, a determined, persistent fellow, would see me and haul me off with only half a dinner, though I protested, and he had already got a surgeon there before me. His thought about the sedan chair, which he had accompanied to Mosley Street to ensure care on the part of the chairman, and had ordered into the very lobby of the house, the cautious manner in which he had lifted Augusta thence, and borne her to the ready couch, coupled with his protection of her daughter in the theatre the night before, weighed down the scale, already trembling in the balance, and Mrs. Ashton's, Jabus, I am deeply indebted to you, was not mere words. He was her messenger to the Chadwicks, her amanuensis to Mr. Ashton, and when Ellen and her mother arrived somewhere about tea-time for the second occasion, he was invited to join their party, and one, if not two, pair of cheeks burned as the invitation was given. Then, the night Mr. Ashton returned home to find Augusta an invalid, he was gratified to see Jabus again at the tea-table, and after that at Todd times, until the restraint upon him gradually wore away, and he would read to Augusta and Ellen as the latter sat at work, and do his best to make the time pass pleasantly. Next, Mr. Ashton took it into his head to teach him that gammon and cribbage to help to make his own evenings at home more lively, and Mrs. Chadwick, who for some occult reason had resisted her husband's desire to show courtesy to his preserver, could scarcely be less gracious than her grandest sister, who owed him so much less. So now the green parlour door in Oldham Street was open to him, and, as Jabez refreshed his memory with Ogar's prints, he felt that he had made another step up the ladder. Those were Alicon days, while Augusta, too tall to be robust, recovered so slowly, and was so much gratified by his attempts to entertain her, Alicon days for more than one, yet ere Jabez was out of his apprenticeship, or Augusta had left her pillowed sofa, a pebble was thrown into the stream, which broke the surface of the tranquil waters and disturbed them for ever. Mr. Ashton was one of the original shareholders in the portico. 
a classic stone building erected in 1806 as a library and reading room on the other side of Mosley Street, which, with its pillared facade and flight of steps, like an ionic temple, looked down on the plain red brick front of the assembly rooms, though its opposite neighbour stood quite as high in repute, and was equally exclusive in its constitution. Mr Aspinall, the Cannon Street cotton merchant, who dined with the Scramble Club, instituted by businessmen whose homes were in the suburbs, was likewise a shareholder in the portico, and from constant meeting at the long tables within the boot-shelled, galleried walls of its lofty reading-room, he and Mr Ashton had a tolerably lengthy acquaintance, although it had never ripened into intimacy, the men were so dissimilar. Charlotte Walmsley was naturally troubled by the result of Madame Broadbent's notion of discipline, and, not unnaturally, considering the condition in which Ben Travis had taken him home, blamed her husband as the primary cause. As naturally, he shifted the onus to the shoulders of Lawrence Aspinall, and, taking him to task, plainly told him he ought to apologise. Lawrence snatched at the proposal. My dear Jack, nothing would please me better. I'll make a thousand apologies if you'll only introduce me. John Walmsley had quite enough of introductions. Besides, he stood in some awe of Mrs. Ashton and did not know how she might take it, especially as his friend Aspinall had acquired the character of a wild spark. He emphatically declined. But if Lawrence Aspinall once set his mind on a thing, he would attain it, if within the range of possibility, whether by fair means or foul, whatever might be the consequences. For a few days he was on his best behaviour at home, and having won his father over by expressions of deep contrition and promises of reformation, and the assurance that he would never again do anything unbecoming a gentleman, he prevailed on him to introduce him to Mr Ashton with a view to making his own apologies in person. Well, Lawrence, you can go with me to the portico tomorrow morning, and, if Mr. Ashton is there, we will see what can be done. The tone in which this was said clearly implying, if we seek an introduction to the Ashtons for the purpose of making the amend honourable as befits gentlemen, there can be no doubt of its acceptance. But when they met Mr. Ashton on the steps of the portico the following morning, the self-complacence of the lofty gentleman received a slight but uncontemplated check. Mr. Ashton nodded to Mr. Aspinall with a beaming face, and would have passed his acquaintance with a mere good morning. But the other stopped, and after shaking hands and remarking that trade was slack, presented with due formality the handsome, elegant, six feet of dandyism, who bore him company. Mr. Ashton, let me make you acquainted with my son, sir, Mr. Ashton, my son Lawrence, Lawrence, Mr. Ashton. The young gentleman raised his stylish beaver from his rich coppery curls, and bowed with courtly grace, in acknowledgment of Mr. Ashton's formal bow, whilst his father continued, almost in the tone of one who confers an honour. The fact is, my son, sir, desires an opportunity of expressing to Miss Ashton his deep regret for the indiscretion of which he was guilty in the lobby of the Theatre Royal some ten days back. The smile faded from the face of Mr. Ashton, who, with a reserve very foreign to him, put his hand into his pocket for his snuff-box, instead of extending it to the young man, and, tapping it with a little impatience, caught at his words. Indiscretion, sir, what you are pleased to call indiscretion, has placed my daughter in the doctor's hands with a broken collarbone. Before Mr. Aspinall could reply, Lawrence, better skilled to temporise, interposed. So, to my infinite regret, my friend Mr. Walmsley has already informed me, sir, and I assure you I take shame to myself that any word or action of mine should have led to consequences so lamentable. No one, sir, can deplore the injury Miss Ashton has sustained more than myself 
the unhappy cause. It is this, Mr. Ashton, which impels me to seek an opportunity to express the sensibility of my grave offence and my extreme regret to Mrs. Ashton and Miss Ashton in person. I cannot rest until I have implored their pardon. The tones in which this apologetic speech was delivered were at once so suave, remorseful, and sympathetic that Mr. Ashton, whose sternness was seldom of long duration, was considerably mollified. He looked at the handsome, dashing blade before him, whose blue eyes seemed full of gentleness and pity, and felt as though the boy he had seen torturing old brutes and the yeomanry officer who had slashed at Mr. Chadwick and Jabez Clegg could never be one and the same. He reverted to the latter circumstance. I think, young sir, you owe an apology to someone else under my roof, the young man who received the sabre cut you designed for my brother-in-law, Mr. Chadwick. Aspinall's handsome face flushed. His father's quick reply gave him time to think. You surely, Mr. Ashton, would not expect my son to apologise to an apprentice lad, a mere college boy? Just so, I would expect him to apologise to anyone he had injured, were it a beggar. Here the son interposed. My good sir, do not remind me of the horrors of that dreadful day. I shudder when I recall it. We acted under orders, and I swear I was utterly unconscious and irresponsible for my actions throughout the whole affray. And Lawrence seemed desirous to wash his hands of the responsibility. The fact is, said Mr. Aspinall, coming to his son's rescue, Lawrence had taken more wine than his young head would stand on both occasions. It takes years to season a cask, you know, Mr. Ashton, and we must not be too hard on young fellows if they slip sometimes. We have all had some wild oats to sow. This was a platitude of the period, but Mr. Ashton's just so was not a cordial assent and Lawrence, fearing the conversation was taking an unfortunate turn, led it back to his original request. But Mr. Ashton tapped his box, and offering it to his interlocutors, took a pinch himself, and then a second, before he came to a decision. It was evidently a debatable question. I will mention your request to Mrs. Ashton, young gentleman, and if I find her agreeable to receive you, I can take you across with me tomorrow morning, provided you meet me here. Good day. Mr. Aspinall's good day was somewhat stiff. He had held his head very high all his life, metaphorically as well as physically, and was not disposed to be snubbed by one whose status he considered scarcely on a par with his own. He was disposed to look on his son's peccadilloes as some of those wild oats which young gentlemen of spirit were expected to sow, and considered his fine figure and beautiful features, his education, accomplishments and prospects, passports to any society, and that Mr. Ashton should for one moment hesitate to open his heart and his doors to his son was an indignity not to be borne. The fact is, Lawrence, that if you make an apology to those people after this, you have less spirit than I take you to have, was his conclusion. Never you mind, father, I know what I'm about. I want to get my foot in there, answered subtle Lawrence, and he managed it. Mr. Ashton went home to dinner, full of his conversation on the portico steps, and set his romantic daughter's heart in a flutter, by mooting the point at issue in her presence. Oh, papa, do bring him. I want to see him again. He is so handsome. Handsome is that handsome does, Augusta, was Mrs. Ashton's commentary on that young lady's impulsive exclamation. Charlotte says he is very wild, remarked Helen, and I feel as if I should shudder at the sight of him after his conduct at Peterloo. You don't shudder when Captain Travis calls, and you don't shut the door in John Wormsley's face, and they may have done things just as bad 
If you did but know it, Ellen, retorted Augusta, standing on the defensive for the absent Adonis. Just so, my dear, so they might, admitted Mr. Ashton, whilst Ellen held her pace, silenced by something in her cousin's retort. Yes, William, but look on the poor bandaged neck and shoulders of our child, and think of that ruffian's cruelty to Jabus and others when a schoolboy. I don't think either John Wormsley or Mr. Travis could have done anything so bad. Well, but, Mamma, argued spoiled Augusta, Jabez forgave him, and I think Madame Broadbent is more to blame than Mr. Aspinall. He only offered to bring me home. Mrs. Ashton shook her head as she rose from table. Besides, Mamma, he says he only wants to apologise, and you know you need not invite him again, unless you like. It would be so rude to refuse. Just so, just so, assented Mr. Ashton, willing to humour his pet in her invalid state. And perhaps it might do the young fellow good to see the consequences of his folly. As usual, where Augusta enlisted her father on her side, Mrs. Ashton's descent grew feebler. The next day, Mr. Ashton made at least one false step in his life and brought over his own threshold a blight. Faultless were the curves of the stylish hat, faultless the fit of pantaloons and coats and Essian boots and York tan gloves, graceful the figure they adorned, graceful the apology tendered so adroitly, more to the mother than to the daughter. But if ever a graceless, good-for-nothing, cast a shadow on a good man's half, it was the wolf in sheep's clothing whose hungry jaws were watering for the pet lamb of the fold, and who made so courtly an exit, full in the sight of Jabus, as he crossed the end of the hall to his solitary dinner in his own room. Chapter 27 Manhood Young as he was, Lawrence Aspinall was wont to say, he wouldn't give a fig for any man who could not be anything in any society. And the Lawrence Aspinall of the cockpit, the ring and the bar parlour was a very different being from the Lawrence Aspinall of the assembly or drawing room. He could be a blackguard amongst blackguards, a gentleman amongst ladies. Nature had done much for him, art had done more. Nature had given him, at twenty-one, a symmetrical figure and art an easy carriage. Nature had given him the clear pink and white complexion, which so often accompanies ruddy hair, and art had trained his early growth of whiskers to counteract effeminacy of skin. Nature had given him a lofty forehead, art had clustered his bronze curls so as to hide how much that brow receded. Nature had given an aquiline nose, eyes of purest azure, flexile lips with curves like Cupid's bow, and heart had taught that eyes set so close, whose hue was so apt to change as temper swayed him, and lips so cruelly thin might be tutored to obey volition and contradict themselves, if so their owner willed. To crown all, nature had gifted him with a flexible voice, and art had set it to music. The Liverpool schoolmaster, had obeyed Mr. Aspinall's instructions to the letter. All that education and accomplishments could do to polish and refine the physical man into the gentleman, as the word was then understood, had been done for him, but under the stucco was the rough brickwork Bob the groom had heaped together, and which no trained or loving hand had removed. Be sure Lawrence Aspinall did not carry this analysis into society, written on his forehead, Instead, he had cultivated the art of fascination, and in the brief space occupied by that apologetic introductory visit in Mosley Street, he not only contrived to dazzle the romance beclouded eyes of Augusta, but what was almost as much to his purpose, to win over Mr. Ashton, and to weaken the prejudice of Miss Augusta's less pliant mamma. Helen Chadwick was the only one on whom he made no impression, the only one who retained a previous opinion confirmed, possibly as Charlotte Wormsley's sister, 
she knew something of his life below the surface, and had imbibed that sister's notion that he led John Wormsley away. Possibly, too, as Charles Chadwick's daughter, she contrasted the silken speech of the drawing-room dandy with the ectoring sword in hand yeomanry cavalry lieutenant who in striking at her father had wounded Jabus, his deliverer, instead. At all events, she met the enthusiastic admiration of Augusta after his departure, the gratified encomiums of her uncle, and the more subdued approbation of her aunt, with the unvarying expression, He would have murdered my dear father but for Jabus Clegg, and Mr Clegg is worth a hundred of him. Mr Lawrence knew better than to presume on that introduction all at once. From their gardens and greenhouses at Hardwick and Fallowfield, he sent small baskets of early flowers and fruit to Mrs Ashton for her daughter, with courteous inquiries, but he allowed several days to elapse before he presented himself in person, and then his call was of the briefest. He knew he had prejudice to overcome, and worked his way gradually. Meanwhile, Augusta progressed favourably, and, if Aspinall grew in favour with the family, so did Jabus. May, sweet-scented month of promise, brought to Jabus Clegg in 1820, his natural and legal heritage, manhood and manhood's freedom. He was no longer an apprentice bound to a master by the will of others. He had a right to think and act for himself, subject only to the laws of God and of the realm. True, that free agency brought with it a train of responsibilities, but the new man was not the one to overlook or ignore the fact. He had thought long and keenly of the coming change, and all it might involve, months before it came. His fixed wages as an indoor apprentice, according to indenture, were no great matter, but, supplemented by coin he extracted from his paint box after business hours, he had found a margin for saving, besides contributing to the humble wants of his early fosterers. The latter duty he had never neglected, but Simon was as sternly just as the lad had been gratefully generous, and, even when poverty bit the hardest, would never accept the whole of his earnings. Say thee, Jabus, if thou dunna keep summat for thyself to put by for a nest egg, thou ne'er seek good o' thy own earnings, and no lose heart in time, the old tanner had been wont to say, when sturdily limiting the extent to which his foster son should open his small purse. So Jabus, leading a steady industrious life, spending little on personal gratification, save what he invested in boots, had quite a little store laid by, the result of very small savings, against the time when he might have to shift for himself. Two things had troubled him, the possibility of having to find a situation elsewhere, Mr Ashton having said no word of retaining him, though, on the contrary, he had said nothing of his removal, and the necessity for quitting the house, which had been to him a home so long that even the grumbling cook and the affectionate dog had welded themselves into his daily life. How much more the kind master and mistress, and that beautific vision, their beautiful bewitching daughter, who had held him in vassalage from the very day of his apprenticeship, and tyrannised over him as only a wayward, spoiled beauty, child or woman, could. The bright morning of the 5th of May set this at rest. He was called into the inner counting-house, and, past the high stools of inquisitive-eyed, quill-driving clerks, with a palpitating heart, conscious how much depended on the issue of that interview. As he opened the curtain-glass door, to his surprise he found himself confronted by not only Mr Ashton, but Mr Chadwick and Simon Clegg, who had been brought from Whaley Bridge for the occasion. Businessmen, as a rule, are not demonstrative over business, and, after the first salutations and surprise greetings, the congratulations of the day were soon said, and the stereotyped, and now to business, put sentiment to flight, and yet not entirely so, as will be seen. There was nothing luxurious in that counting-house of the past, 
Beside the high desk and stool, it contained an oilcloth-topped hexagon table with a deep rim of partition drawers, three wooden chairs, a sort of fireguard fender, and a poker. But there was neither carpet nor oilcloth on the floor, and the walls had but a dim recollection of paint. Mr. Ashton, snuff-box in hand, occupied one of these chairs. Mr. Chadwick, resting hands and chin on a stout walking stick, another. The third, a little apart, had been assigned to old Simon, now on the shady side of seventy. Jabez remained standing. Mr. Ashton, as was his manner, tapping his fingers on his snuff-box lid, whilst he spoke, opened fire. No doubt, Jabez, you have been expecting me to say something respecting your prospects and position, when your indentures are given up. Well, sir, answered Jabez with a frank smile, I believe I have. Just so, I knew you would. It was but likely, and I should have spoken to you some time since. But for Brother Chadwick here, both Mrs. Ashton and myself have watched your conduct and progress during the whole term of your apprenticeship with entire satisfaction. Here, a pinch of snuff emphasised the sentence, and both Simon and Jabez felt their cheeks begin to glow. You have been unusually steady and persevering. I've not been merely obedient, but obliging, and your rectitude does full credit to the honourable name Parson Brutes gave to you. This was quite a long speech for Mr. Ashton. He paused to take breath, and old Simon, proud of the young man as if he'd been his own son, feeling the encomium as some sort of halo around his own grey head, exclaimed, I'm downright proud to hear you say it, sir. It'll make our Bessie's heart leap with joy. But Jabez, blushing, half ashamed of hearing his own praises wrung out as from a belfry, could only stammer forth, I've endeavoured to do my duty. That is all, sir. At all, interjected Mr. Chadwick in his imperfect speech. Nelson said J -j duty was all ingler and expected of ev every man. But it won the ba battle of Traf Tra Tra Trafalgar. Duty wins the battle of life, brother, put in Mrs. Ashton, who had quietly entered the counting house by the door behind Jabez. Just so, just so, assented Mr. Ashton, as he rose and handed his chair to the lady, whose stately presence seemed to fill the room. And Jabez has only to continue doing his duty to win his battle of life, I take it. But to our business, you have hitherto served us well, Jabez, in the warehouse and out of it. You have been doubly useful to me as a designer and as a detector of the roguery and mismanagement of others. Then, to my daughter, who is far dearer than either warehouse or trade, you have rendered more than one service. Oh, sir, do not name it, I beg. It has been my highest pleasure to serve Miss Ashton or yourself, Jabez exclaimed, the last two words rising to his lips simultaneously with the thought that his sudden outburst might fail of appreciation by Miss Ashton's wealthy relatives. Just so, but I must name it, Jabez, as a reason for my proposal to retain you in my employ, and for assigning to you a situation and salary higher than is usually accorded to an apprentice just out of his time. But as you have shown stability and judgment beyond your years, and I know you to be honourable in all respects, I feel I am justified in making the offer. Mr. Ashton then stated, with a little seasoning of snuff, the salary he proposed to give the young man, and the duties he required as an equivalent, if Jabez accepted his proposition. The eyes of Jabez sparkled, and his cheeks glowed. As for Simon, he seemed dumb with delight and astonishment at the good fortune of the foundling. If, cried Jabez, there can be no if, sir, you overpower me with an offer so far above my deserts. I accept it most grateful. Stay, Mr. Clegg, interrupted Mrs. Ashton, as Mr. Chadwick raised his head from its rest on his hands and stick, and made an ineffectual effort to speak. Think twice before you speak once, 
my brother. Oh, madam, there is no need, Jabez began, but she silenced him with a mere gesture of her raised hand, and Mrs. Ashton, acting as interpreter for her slow-tongued brother-in-law, resumed. You have done us some services, Mr. Clegg, but a man will give all he possesses for his life, and Mr. Chadwick feels that his debt to you is greater than ours. Jabez looked from one to another bewildered. Mr. Ashton took up the threat. Just so, and that brings me to the point we have been driving at. You see, Jabez, Mr. Chadwick is not so capable of managing his business as he used to be. Things go wrong, he scarcely knows how, and he is desirous to bring someone into his warehouse on whom he can rely. He therefore offers to take you at a higher salary than I think at all suitable for so young a man, and if you prove your competence to take the management within a reasonable time to give it over into your hands, and ultimately it may be in a very few years, to give you a small partnership interest in the concern. It is difficult to say whether Jabez or Simon was the most completely stunned. You must not look on this altogether as a testimony to your business qualifications, Jabez, I think, continued Mr. Ashton, but as the outflow of a grateful heart and the proposition of a man who has no son capable of keeping his trade together. Is not that so? turning to Mr. Chadwick. So, so certainly, Jabez looked from one to another, then to Simon, but no help was forthcoming from that quarter. Mrs. Ashton came to his relief. I think, Mr. Clegg, you had better look before you leap. Whatever decision you make will equally satisfy us, but I see you need time to consider. Suppose you consult your foster father, and give Mr. Ashton your decision at the outcome supper tonight. The hesitation of Jabez was only momentary. We are told that all the marvels and glories of paradise were revealed to Mohammed before a single drop of water had time to flow from a pitcher overturned in his upward flight. And even whilst Mrs. Ashton spoke, Jabez had time to think. Thank you, madam, said he. But I need no deliberation. I know not for whose kindness to be most grateful. But I do know that I should be most ungrateful if I were to quit the master and mistress to whom both myself and my dear friends owe so very much for the first tempting offer made to me. Mr. Chadwick overrates my service. Mr. Mabber rendered quite as efficient aid. Besides, I have no acquaintance with the manufacture of peace goods and have no right to take advantage of Mr. Chadwick's extreme generosity, knowing my own disqualifications. And, pardon my saying so, if Mr. Chadwick has no mercantile son, he may some day have a son-in-law better fitted in every way for the office and promise held out to me. I trust, Mr. Chadwick, you will not consider me ungracious in declining your liberal offer, but, indeed, I have been trained to the smallware manufacture, and here lies my duty, for here I feel I may be able to render something of a quid pro quo. Before anyone had time for reply, the infirmary clock struck twelve, and, as if simultaneously, there was a rush from the warehouse into the yard, an outcry and a din, as if Babel had broken loose. The sacred precinct of the counting house was invaded, and Jabus was carried off Viet Armis.